One difficulty generally is uh, one route that's usually not available is getting a law passed because that involves persuading legislators to give up the power to draw their own districts. And so generally speaking, law, you know, petitioning a legislature to do this is actually pretty hard. Not impossible, but it is hard. Uh, citizen referendum is a better way to achieve these things. Or a period where there's single party. I mean, there's, one can think of ways of doing it, but I, I don't really want to get too far into the weeds there, except to point out that these rules make a big difference. And there's a whole, I just got back from a conference in which people talked about how to get laws passed to reform your districting. And that's a tough political problem. Uh, and you know, evidently, New Jersey is currently not on red alert as being some kind of massive violation. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to take a couple more, and then I'm going to keep on going. But go ahead. Can we go back to the swing vote for just a second? Yeah. Uh, 435, what would you estimate the number of percentage of swing districts? Um, you know, estimates vary as to how many true swing districts there are, just to state the obvious. Um, the number of swing districts depends on how much of a swing you imagine is going to happen. But I would say that um, probably ballpark nationally, there are no more than about 30 or 40 swing districts. And one would regard most, almost all the remaining 195 districts as being pretty safe for one party or the other. So even, so under the current situation, I think the Republicans have a 40 seat majority. So even if you're done with no. it's accurate, it wouldn't really make a pick up 20 seats, your margin goes up by 40, right? Because your side gains a seat and the other side loses a seat. So 40, flipping, I mean, let's just say hypothetically that, uh, let's say that those 40 seats are half Democratic and half Republican. The seat margin can go up by 40 or it can go down by 40. And so there is the possibility with the swing districts that exist now for Democrats to take control of the House. But it's a pretty very extensive prospect. Uh, yeah, I, you can keep on asking about that, but yeah. Uh, yes, that is true. But I've already expressed what the margin would take. It would take about an eight, seven or eight percent popular vote win nationally. Okay? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, let me keep on going since uh, time is short. Um, okay, so I write about Jerry a little bit on my election website. I'm also the website here that talks about the arcana of gerrymandering law. And I'm going to go into some of the, that arcana a bit. But let me just show you, um, and this perhaps addresses the question that you just asked. I'm sorry, there's a new pointer. All right, um, so let me just use the mouse pointer here. So if you look here, this is now a histogram of the Democratic vote share across all congressional districts. And addressing the question that was just asked about just how many true districts there are, um, it turns out that actually maybe I underestimated it. But if you look at these bars in the histogram that are just very close to this vertical line, just shy of 50% for, uh, for one side or the other, you can see that maybe there's more than 40 seats that are swim districts. But there's a distinct phenomenon that's at work here, which is you can also see by looking at this histogram that there are a lot of seats that are uncontested Republican seats uncontested Democratic seats. And finally, you can see that this histogram has two bumps in it. So right here, where you would imagine by laws of statistics, you would think that you would see a big bump here in the middle, which is the way these distributions are supposed to look uh, from a statistician's point of view. Instead, there's two bumps. There seems to be one set of districts that's mostly Republican, and, and even though this doesn't seem like a big difference, a 60% Republican district is a very safe district. Over here, we have a district that's, let's see, 55, 60 to 70 percent Democratic. Those are very safe Democratic districts. And so you can see there that this histogram looks like a camel with two humps, or one might normally expect one hump. And this influence is just the shortage of close districts. And you can see here, this is now states that where one party control redistricting. In particular, it's Republican-controlled states. And these are the states where they achieve the greatest gains relative to uh, what a simple statistical model would predict would be the number of seats they get. And the seats where they got the biggest gains are also states where they were able to carve out districts for themselves that they were that, uh, uh, that they won very narrowly, that uh, where the Democratic vote share is close to 40%, and where Democrats were packed into the districts where they won by very large margins. And this phenomenon of packing your opponents into districts and then spreading your, your own party support is real thin across a larger number of districts. This is the phenomenon of partisan redistricting. 
And you can see here just by eye that these two humps make some substantial contribution to these two humps here. And so this is what I'm talking about. I mentioned when we were in the other room that population clustering makes a significant contribution to this. Single party control for redistricting uh, makes a contribution to this. And what we end up with is this two hump feast that, um, that has this quality of having fewer competitive seats than one would expect uh, by chance. Okay, yes? This sort of a backfire for Republicans, so if they have more seats that are within the swing range, whereas the Democrats have more seats that are secure than a big anti-Trump backlash could potentially be affected. Right. So there are ways that this strategy can fail. Basically, it's exactly what you're saying. The name of the game is to build districts for yourself that are safe, uh, just safe enough. Right. So if you make them too safe, then you don't really get so much an advantage. So for instance, if you build a bunch of districts where your side gets 70% majorities, the other side gets 70% majorities, that's a bipartisan gerrymander where all you've done is just make everybody safe, which, uh, which you know, doesn't lead to a partisan advantage for your own side. Unless you're already ahead. to make one home, you know, 70, one set of wins 70%, <coughs> your own side, say, 60%, 55%. But as you're saying, what if, the, what if they, they build a levy for themselves as a the levy's not high enough. If there's a wave election, then they go down. There is a substantial danger of this because if you think about close districts, close districts actually, as it turns out, tend to have uh, bigger swings from election to election. Uh, it may be that they have more moderate voters who can swing either direction, and so therefore there is more of a chance of things going wrong. Uh, but broadly speaking, the strategy of redistrictors is to avoid the problem, and that's basically it's actually kind of an interesting intellectual challenge to build. Partisan advantage by drawing maps. I would say that if, if I had different sets of ethical priorities, <laughs> I would find it a super interesting challenge to build districts that are super safe and maximize the gains from my party. I, I think it's an interesting problem. Uh, I, uh, unlike, actually, at this conference I was at last week, there was somebody who was a former redistrictor who had changed his stripes and was interested in reform, but he knew all about. How to draw districts to make them asymmetric in the way I described. <coughs> okay, so look, um, we've got some, uh, we're, we're actually very short on time, so let me just talk very briefly because I don't want to go over time. Let me talk about how one would deal this with this through courts. The question is, how can one deal with how can one diagnose gerrymandering? How can one, can one pursue it through the courts? And I'm going to talk about a project that I've embarked on that started to be a more and more significant part of my efforts. So the idea of gerrymandering goes back to 1812 when Elbridge Gerry was governor of Massachusetts when the Massachusetts legislature drew districts to suit its own party. Um, and this is just a cartoon from that time. And poor Elbridge Gerry got saddled with this label uh, despite the fact that he didn't write the law. Uh, he was governor at the time, so he got, kind of got, got stuck with it. Um, yeah. Anyway, so one issue with gerrymandering is it turns out that it's actually pretty hard to define gerrymandering, at least from a court standpoint, through boundaries. An obvious way to imagine that you would define a gerrymandering is, okay, what if a, ger what if a district has a really odd shape? And this is now a rogues gallery of districts, and I assure you that every one of these is landlocked, except for this is the North Shore of Ohio. But th these six districts here are surrounded by land, and yet they assume these odd, odd shapes. So you might think that therefore shape would be a factor. It turns out that the Supreme Court, this is where math and legislative precedent and court precedent come into collision. The law of the land is defined by the Supreme Court is that districts should be compact. But compactness can be metaphorical. <laughs> and that second one is the problem. So compactness might be a nice shape that's not wiggly, or can all, it can also be the communities of interest that have shared priorities, for instance being of similar ethnicity, that that can also be compact. Which is the opposite of compactness, right? You can like draw any old shape and make sure that you get like, I don't know, uh, the Dominicans in one place and Puerto Ricans in another place in New York City, and you put them put together in one big district. That also meets the definition of compactness. So, so it turns out shape is a non-starter in terms of Supreme Court control over redistricting. It's, it's, uh, it also turns out that you can actually do a pretty good job of gerrymandering without drawing strange shapes. And this has been the case in Michigan and North Carolina, where legislators have done a clever job of gerrymandering with relatively straight boundaries. Um, the injustice is like this. In 2012, the Pennsylvania voters 
uh, voted for more voted for Democrats than for Republicans, yet in fact 13 Republicans were elected and five Democrats were elected. And that's just an example of the kind of distortions that can happen as a result of gerrymandering. Uh, this was uh, true in 2012, uh, but if you look previously in Pennsylvania history, uh, if you look back a decade or so, that didn't happen so much. North Carolina, the same is true in 2012, where more, more people voted for Democratic candidates, and yet uh, there are only four out of 13 representatives who are Democrats, and now actually as of this year, that's down to three out of 13. And so this is an example of the kind of distortions that occur. Um, this is accomplished, as I said, by packing in uh, Democrats into a few districts, spreading out Republicans over more districts, and the vote margins here are 55 to 66 percent, and the vote margins here are 69 to 89 percent. So you can see here that legislators did a pretty good job of packing Democrats into these five out of 18 districts. So that's an example of how it's done. And the question is, how do you explain to a court this idea? How do you come up with something simple that a judge can compute as easily as possible? And to skip ahead because we're uh, short on time, nationally, indefinitely? Sleeping bags. <laughs> I think that people, speaking as a neuroscientist, I think people's attention is more finite than the amount of time we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to still compress my presentation a little bit in order to have a better discussion, if that's okay. Um, so, long story short, uh, redistricting right now appears to be worth about a 10 to 15 seat advantage for the Republican Party, and that means a margin since it double that, a margin of more like 20 to 30 seats. And so what that means is that a pretty significant component of the Republican majority in Congress is currently, uh, thanks to partisan gerrymandering, and this is just a histogram of the seat difference from the neutral outcome uh, from a calculation that I've done. If you look here, uh, compared with simulations based on how districting is done nationwide, these red squares here are states in which Republicans control the redistricting process. This blue square is where Democrats control the redistricting process. These black ones are bipartisan commissions. If you look here, Republicans gain some advantage of between one and four seats from redistricting. And so consequently, they gain a pretty substantial advantage uh, from redistricting in the, after the 2010 cycle. And roughly speaking, the challenge is coming up with showing judges how to define these offenses here that might be on either end of the system, finding a way for judges to easily identify these offenses so they can trim this histogram. And so what a judge wants is some kind of tool that's called manageable. So the, the, the word that Anthony Kennedy has used is manageable. There's a, a desire for a manageable standard to basically identify these offenders and cut them off. And so one would like to be able to have like a little tool, like a tool for cutting cloth, and so measure, 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 snip, snip, and then cut off these ends of the histogram and say, these states over here at the ends of the histogram, you should go back and try again and come up with something that is less partisan. So that's the challenge. How do you come up with something? Now, I should interrupt this to say that um, judges, lawyers generally, do not choose their profession because they love math. <laughs> there are lawyers who are good at math. There are judges who are good at math. But they don't choose those lines of work because they love math. So in approaching the Supreme Court, there's the challenge of how to approach them in a way that doesn't you know, spook them too much. So if I say, well, you know, I did a numerical simulation and I drew a billion possible districts, like, like one could imagine making some progress that way, but it is not the natural language of judges. And so the question is, how can we come up with something that will work with judges? I'm going to show you what we've been working on. So <laughs> is the law of gerrymandering an impregnable fortress? Right? Is there some way in it? Is there some weakness where one could go, right? could one find a way through legal precedent? Now, it turns out that the late Justice Scalia, when he last weighed in on the subject, was, uh, I believe, in 2006, in a case called Lulac versus Perry. And he said, look, it's just hopeless. We've been trying and trying for decades. We don't have a way of defining partisan gerrymandering. It's an offense, but we don't have a good way of identifying the most egregious offenses. Can we just simply give this up as a bad job? And four justices of the Supreme Court at that time including Scalia, so three others agreed with him, and it was a 5-4 decision where four justices were on Scalia's side. On the other side were five justices, and one of them was um, Anna 
Anthony Kennedy. And so the current composition of the court is four liberals who uh, uh, who've been relatively open to the idea of identifying some kind of standard that can identify partisan gerrymandering. Uh, four conservatives who either think that it's uh, unresolvable or uh, in some cases they may even think that it's simply not desirable for the court to get engaged in legislative uh, uh, jiggery pokery. <laughs> so they like to use that in the decision. So here's a guy with the words. But Anthony Kennedy has said, well, you know, there might be a standard. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll know when I see it. And, uh, and I think that maybe technological means might be helpful in resolving this. So my effort in this regard is an article that I invite you to look up once we're all done in here. And it's this article that I wrote in the Stanford Law Review called Three Tests for Practical Evaluation of Partisan Gerrymandering. And this builds on an idea that five justices of the Supreme Court have said are, is an interesting idea that they might be able to sign on to. And the idea is one of partisan symmetry. And the idea of partisan symmetry is defined as follows. A symmetric scheme is one in which if the two parties switched their shares of the vote at a statewide level, then they would switch the number of seats they got. So now, this doesn't mean the obvious thing, which is like, imagine if every race switched well, obviously, if every race switched, then of course the number of seats would switch as well, right? Because everywhere a Democrat won, the, the Republican would win, and vice versa. So that's not what's meant here. What's meant here is, at a statewide level, if the total statewide vote were switched, would this party switch places in the popular vote? I wanted to show you an example of what that looks like. This is now.
for gauging how likely this is. And this zone of chance is a version of a confidence interval in which what I've plotted here is where those averages would have to be if they, if they arose by chance. And so by chance, you would expect these two averages to be no more different than uh, to be within the zone of chance. But you can see here that, in fact, the Democratic vote share is much larger than the Republican vote share. And so one can show statistically that the actual election outcome is highly unlikely to have arisen by chance in the last three elections. And so that's an example of what one could do using not too much math. The t-test is something available to you in a highly advanced piece of software in your computer called Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and it has the name, wait for it, t-test. <laughs> so if you go into Microsoft Excel, you can actually perform a t-test yourself. It's super easy to do. And so this is one uh, relatively easy answer for how the Supreme Court could, <coughs> in fact, um, judge um, partisan gerrymandering. Anthony Kennedy might not be so computer savvy, but certainly his clerks are. And so if his clerks can do it, then they can pass it on to Justice Kennedy, and then maybe he might adopt it. So that's an example of, of one possible solution. So um, we're over time, and I would love to have a general discussion with you either about tactics, uh, activist, legislative, or judicial tactics. But I just want to say that I'm not a political scientist at all, and my goal here is to do something that Robert Kennedy said when he inspired people with the Bernard Sharp quote. Um, he said some men think, see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. And I'm thinking a more limited view, so a political scientist might say some men and women see things as they are and say why. And I'm somewhere between that, and what I'm trying to do is get between that and something even more limited, which is some men and women see things as, as they are. And so what I'm trying to do is show you statistics that shows you, shows you how things are, with the hopes of getting you back towards saying why, and then maybe even getting back to Kennedy's original idea. So I'll stop there and take questions.
share of seats one. Did I understand correctly that the grey region you showed that the vast majority of the electoral results lay inside had a... The grey shaded area was 